Wow. My insides feel good. What is up, guys? Coach Joe here at the Lion's Den, and today I'm joined with two amazing people. We have Omar Isof, Alan Thrall. Hi. We're just hanging out and always trying to bring you guys cool content and information, and these guys have been in the game for a long time, uh, probably longer than I. So they have some wisdom on training, life, you name it. And what I wanted to ask them to share with you guys is maybe something that they thought starting off in their training journey, and as time went on, that uh, idea either evolved or maybe even changed. Uh, so just wanted them to give us a couple uh, little of those segments, and we'll see how it goes. So we'll start off with Al, it's Alan Thrall. How long have you been in the game? What do you do? I was born in the game. <laughs> you was born I've never in the left game. the game. <laughs> you came out of the game. Uh, and then just kind of give us your first one, then we'll kick it off with Omar. Uh, I've been lifting since eighth grade in preparation for high school football. Uh, and I've owned a gym since uh, for s about six years now, so since uh, 2013. And I would say the first thing, the most glaringly obvious uh, thing to me is not one thing, but um, I think that it was uh, be straightforward when I was a starting strength coach and I was uh, thinking that there's you know, only one way to do things, one way to perform the lifts, and there's only one particular way to get strong. Uh, I don't agree with that anymore. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that comparing, as far as like uh, lifting mechanics, I think that comparing things to a stick figure or an illustration um, has its flaws. Um, and that doesn't always pan out in the real world. So it'll so, be like an uh, actual example of that with a lifter, you, you would say? Well, I think that uh, just being so rigid with, like for example, the starting strength model of squatting, that this is the best way to squat, which is something that I really used to believe, is uh, incorrect. There are world-class uh, squatters who squat you know, differently from what the model teaches. And who am I to say that their squat would be even better if they followed this particular model. This isn't a roast on starting strength at all. This is just uh, you know, me being straightforward that I used to believe that stuff and I don't anymore. Nice. Omar? Here's Alan being real serious and I was just gonna dick around and now I gotta be serious, you know what I mean? Like he just went all the way in. Our posture is changing <laughs> yes. slightly. Yeah. Um, so I would say for myself, it's not a top one, but just one that came to mind when you brought up this topic, would just be the role of cardiovascular exercise in lifting. Mm -hmm. um, I would say earlier on, I had a bias in favor of uh, cardiovascular work being necessary, let's say in the first place for weight loss, as an example, right? Where I knew that you had to be in a caloric deficit in order to lose weight, but I, I thought the overall role of cardiovascular work was larger, meaning that in order to, in quotations, mobilize fat, I've been uh, a trainer now for over a decade, I'm like, oh, you, you'll you lose a certain amount of fat, but to have that P ratio, the ratio either of gaining weight, how much is muscle, how much is fat, or losing weight, how much is muscle, how much is fat, I thought it would be more preferential if you did cardiovascular work as opposed to just being in a deficit. Um, I also thought that cardiovascular work was more important to keep in in terms of a long-term basis, in terms of uh, you needing it as just part of your daily life. I think it's useful. I think it's a useful tool. I think if we define cardiovascular work here, I'm talking about uh, work that's above 120, 130 beats a minute, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this isn't walking throughout the day, your need or those activities, but just for in quotations, overall health. Um, I think there are many different ways to achieve similar results. And I think that just running on a treadmill is merely one way. I actually think depending upon the modality of training, you can achieve similar results just even with lifting weights or some activity that's outside the gym. So programming for clients early on in my career would always include a cardiovascular component almost regardless of goals, but it's just something that's tacked on without the context. So I'm not saying at all the cardiovascular work is bad, but just the hierarchy of how important it was either for weight loss or then for general performance 
was higher back in the day versus now. I still think it's a useful tool, but like I said, every single client I'd program for would include some sort of cardiovascular component. Oh, you wanna uh, build muscle? Oh, you wanna lose weight? I think it's a useful tool now, so it's been downgraded for sure. Cool. Yeah. Next what about one? you? What about me? Oh, I was just asking them questions. Oh, you didn't write on a whiteboard. I don't have a whiteboard. Ooh, I will say, I used to kind of piggyback off of yours with conditioning is I used to use uh, cardio as my main source to lose weight, I would say, when I was trying to lose weight. But then as I developed a better relationship with food, I realized it was much easier to just be in a caloric deficit from eating versus tacking on tons and tons of extra cardio. You'll work harder and you'll lose fat. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So yep. that was that's a one for me. Um, I didn't really have, other than the first one, specific things that I would say you know, I'm wrong. I was wrong about, but more ideas. And I think that um, one thing that I used to kind of believe is that, uh, you know, maybe subconsciously that I always had to provide an answer. Uh, but now I'm okay with saying I'm not really sure, even with clients or uh, just any general question. I felt like I always, you know, I was this point of authority and I always had to say why this hurts or why this lift is struggling uh, when there's a you know there's a lot of context to those questions and i i'm more comfortable now with saying i'm not really sure you know we'll figure it out but back then i think i was pretty quick to give an answer yeah uh, fuck you because that was basically my second point uh so no i'd say uh, so scope of practice and i would have to give eric helms credit just doing that uh, podcast iron culture with him where he talks about that a lot just what is the role of a trainer, right? And so someone might, even if we talk about motivation, where uh, let's talk about the client trainer role, the whole concept of a rent a friend. So besides getting some knowledge wrong or offering advice that's way beyond your scope of practice. So someone says like, oh, like this hurts. Like, well, it's one, two, three, four, and this is what you need to do. And I could tell, I, I don't know you, but I could definitely tell. P.S. I took this weekend course. So that's kind of obvious, but even the dynamic or how you approach training an individual to try and foster that relationship. Coaching is so much more than just knowledge. And so scope of practice is not just the knowledge uh, component of it, but it's also the relationship and the dynamic that you attempt to foster. Mm -hmm. Where I don't know if you guys feel this, but this relates now uh, again to when I started out. You could sometimes turn into that role with a client where you're sort of that rent a friend uh, as a personal trainer. And the question becomes with the hour that I have with this person, am I maximizing my time in order to help them reach their goal? Mm -hmm. As opposed to kind of just listening to them where it's either like a passive role you're doing or you're not framing things in the correct way to help them have those own individual epiphanies to push them towards where they need to be. Mm -hmm. um, so scope of practice where it's like, yeah, like I'll, I'll be your emotional support here. Well, it's like, well, let's back up a second. Like, what, what am I actually trying to do here by being your trainer? And so offering, attempting to offer ad advice that you shouldn't, where it's outside of your scope, but also how you try and interact with clients in order to help them figure out what they want. And I think now what I try and do more is I try and lead people to answer questions for themselves in terms of goals or all those sorts of things. So scope of practice and then how you approach the whole training paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. My second one would be, um, I used to have that belief that I had to quote unquote destroy myself with every training session. And if I wasn't doing that, I wasn't getting the proper results. It was just kind of that go hard, go home mentality. Um, but over the years, I've realized that that's not the case. You know, we're in it for the long term and trying to manage stress correctly where you don't have to be, you know, sore and quote unquote, like I said, smashed or destroyed or all the adjectives you'll see on Instagram that I thought were cool at one point to post and say those things. Um, even psychologically, not realizing how they may have been affecting me on a deeper level. Um, so just in programming in general, realizing that I think way more long term and sustainable. Uh, results in managing fatigue better overall. Last one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me see what the last one. So I've got, uh, there's more than one way to do things. Uh, I can say, I don't know. And then, ah, uh, yes. So I used to think that uh, Omar Isaf knows what he's talking about. And now, and I have learned since then. But since this video. I couldn't be more, <laughs> yeah. couldn't be more wrong. So I'm uh, much, much wiser now. Yeah. And I don't ever click on an Omar Isaf video. Yeah. Damn. That makes uh, two of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Clear out the way. Yeah, 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 totally wrong. Yeah. yeah, we all know someone that that's happened to. <laughs>
Raw video. Take 21. My final point that I would say is to be careful not to attach yourself to one identity. And both myself or individuals that I would coach were belonging to a strength facility has been fantastic and I thoroughly enjoy it. But all too often I'll see people and I've had to check myself where they'll say either I'm a power lifter, right? Like this is what I am, this is what I plan on doing. I'm like, well, when you first started lifting, you weren't a power lifter. You are just someone that wanted to get in shape. And uh, things are kind of nebulous, your goals, where they change over time. And you realize you have certain realizations that you, as you continue to change what you want to do. And that might once again, change over time where it's not this constant thing. And I think people sometimes need that safety, the uh, certainty of belonging to a tribe. And so they'll find their home and that's fantastic. But if it overstays, it's welcome. So uh, as an example, there's an older lifter at the gym that I go to that is just, you know, he, he's legitimately past 50 and he's been suffering numerous setbacks. Strength training, it gave him a renewed sense of purpose, helped him get into the gym. But now he's facing so many obstacles, he's nowhere near hitting his old numbers and he's kind of just spinning his wheels and he's becoming demotivated. And so one of the things that actually Sean, the owner had him do, is just change up his training. So he's doing, in quotations, more hypertrophy oriented training. He basically was kind of more of a West Side guy, so he stuck to very low repetitions. And so his training has kind of done a 180. But because there's the novelty there for him, and because he's not attached now to his own previous numbers, his adherence to the gym is at an all time high. Um, so I would say, becoming attached to one identity, especially considering that we all didn't start out that way. When we started lifting, we just started lifting because maybe we had you know, superficial goals or maybe we just enjoyed doing it and we get caught up along the way. You just have to check it and it's okay actually if in fact you have found your calling and you have found your tribe and you know for sure that's what you wanna do. But understand, after lifting for a decade and especially having my university friends where we all started lifting together. I think there's six of us, and now only two of us continue to lift and exploring those reasons. And some, I'm talking some were high caliber, either athletes, football players, and so forth. So these were motivated individuals. Things change, times change, their perspective uh, is different. That's okay, but trying to stay consistent in the gym and finding kind of that discipline and the reason why you want to be there is most important. So thanks guys, I appreciate you guys coming on the channel and talking about some things that maybe aren't talked about enough. We're always trying to be real and present you guys honestly just genuine content to help you along your journey. Like we said, maybe you're just starting, maybe you're in the middle, maybe you've been in it for the long haul. These are all tips we can kind of fall back on to help us through whatever period uh, that we're in. It's just giving a, you guys a little bit of some tidbits to keep you pushing. Uh, so make sure you guys check out their channels. They're very well known, very well known, no, no, no. We got Alan Thrall, Omar Isoff. We'll put their little things. Their little things. <laughs> they, have, little they have little things. They have little things. Little things right there. Please be accurate. Yes. <laughs> I'm very accurate. Very accurate. But subscribe to them if you aren't already. And uh, we got lots of good stuff coming. Peace.